Zero and lift off. to that whole operation, we had a, a, a huge set of work ahead of us. Uh, stowing the rover and getting it ready for shipment um, meant a lot of shifts in a row, uh, a lot of uh, complex operations with the vehicle. And, and you have to remind yourself, every time you pick that rover up, it's almost a billion dollars worth of hardware uh, that, that you're watching out for every time you do something with it. So um, that, that part got to be really white knuckles for us. It makes us a little nervous sometimes. I mean, you worry about the environment. It's it's on a, a forklift. It gets put on the on the back of a, a flatbed truck and then run down the, the highway to March Air Force Base from JPL. And that whole transport um, is is just like you're you're driving any other uh, any other truck down the highway. So it's it's full of, of bumps and and it takes lumps and and so it's it's one of those that that you worry about for sure. It's a very impressive operation to get the shipping containers up into the aircraft. Uh, these boxes are incredibly large and, uh, and even as big as, uh, as big an aircraft as the C-17 is, uh, it is barely big enough to fit these boxes. There's an entire team of Air Force uh, reservists to help us load this, uh, led by the loadmaster who uh, was in charge of the winching operation. Um, basically, they use the aircraft cable system and hydraulic winch to uh, hook up to the container and tow it on board. As that happens, uh, you have a team of uh, about eight other Air Force crew members, plus all of the payload crew members, all of the MSL crew members that we had with us, watching all of the corners, making sure that, that everything was clearing and that the measurements were right and that, that we weren't going to run into a problem as the, if the shipping container got offline for any reason. Even despite the best planning, uh, we can find ourselves in, in a spot where we still have to solve some of the problems. We need thick plywood to reduce the contact pressure on the, the wheels on the shipping container. You have this, this thing which weighs you know, 10,000 pounds or more and you have to be, make sure you don't punch a hole in the aircraft floor. So we had to get thicker plywood. We had to make emergency calls out here to Kennedy Space Center to make sure that enough plywood was on hand when we landed so that we would actually have that same accommodation on the way off of the aircraft. All of those operations had to be undone once we uh, got down to the ground here at KSC, and so the, the operations uh, on the tarmac, including the offloading of the shipping containers, uh, had to be done uh, just in the same way. The same crew uh, then, uh, after the five-hour flight, um, stepped up and, and uh, had to check all of those clearances again, uh, make sure all of the rigging was, was out of the way and that the winch system was ready to help uh, lower the, the shipping containers down the ramp. Uh, you didn't want it to get the, the shipping container to get away from you and, and roll out onto the tarmac and you know get get out of control. So, um, but they did a, a really nice, careful job. And again, we had uh, all of the same crew that were there uh, at March Air Force Base here at KSC, plus our arrival crew. We had a fresh crew of folks uh, who were well rested to be able to take care of a lot of the ground operations once we arrived here. So that those of us who had been going for almost 48 hours straight. Um, didn't have to also uh, finish out the, that part of the job. We're about to send uh, our baby on a, a very long journey to go uh, spend its life uh, exploring the surface of Mars. That's, that's uh, it's a big leap of faith to be able to hand off the vehicle. Uh, they have a great team uh, on the launch vehicle side and they're, they're ready to take care of it. But we are, <laughs> we are definitely nervous parents. We are wrapping up the last of the vehicle test and uh, get ready to make it a real spacecraft here before too long. It's going to be a big push, but that's kind of how the end game goes. We try to get things ready and every last thing has to be done and done right. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to do it. 
we have a lot of work to do in the next two months because although uh, the vehicles in Florida, we've, we've stacked it together just in the last couple of days. Uh, the rover has got its rocket jet pack on it and the jet pack and the rover together has been, have been put in the back shell of the vehicle and we're, we're, right now we're putting the cruise stage on top. Uh, in some sense, um, th that process is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, the challenge we have here in Pasadena is finishing up all our testing. All of our testing on the, in our test bed and on the equipment and going through and looking all the problems we had in our test program, make sure that, that all the problems we found were all solved and that we know what we're going to do and how we're going to fly it. Three, two, one, fire. Everyone stand by. Testing is a lot like um, renovating your house. Uh, you can enumerate some very large obvious things to do and then when you do them it becomes clear that there are some second order, secondary things to do. And then when you do those you discover third order, fourth order, ad infinitum. We require our system to be able to be robust to survive a number of different kinds of faults, um, both uh, internal faults, things breaking on the spacecraft, or um, uh, loss of sun data coming into the sun sensor, a variety of, of unfortunate circumstances uh, we try to make our design robust to. But not only have we driven the rover, we've removed its arm, put it all through its paces, but it's been in a thermal vacuum chamber and kept very cold. It, parts of it have been on through in a centrifuge. We've done drop tests, pull tests, drive tests, load tests, stress tests. Um, it's just an amazing amount of testing this vehicle has gone through. We've done shorting tests. We've taken the vehicle and shorted electronics. We've looked to see that the radios all work together and that the rover doesn't interact with itself in bad ways. We've tried every way of operating in the vehicle using the software. Literally thousands and thousands of hours of software testing. It's been just a, an amazing several years really of constant testing and development, finding problems, fixing those problems, and going on to the next problem. The system is sufficiently complex that anything you change has to be done with great care and caution um, and then tested um, thoroughly because of the potential for side effects, unintended um, consequences of the fix. Uh, the first uh, rule of engineering uh, this late in the game is do no harm. This is a very, very complicated beast. This is by far the most complex thing we've ever built. It's almost hard to imagine how complex it is. And in fact, if you get, a, get close up to the vehicle, you can see the richness of detail. And in fact, this vehicle almost has fractal-like complexity. The more you look at it, the more details that you uncover. And you have to make sure when you're building this thing and testing it and designing it, that those interactions are well understood and that, you, and that there is nothing about the system that will, will interfere with itself. And uh, this has been a, a real challenge that we've had. And so every minute of the time we've had, we've been using that time with uh, incredible intensity. So we'll, hopefully we'll take a big breath in, the, in, uh, in mid-November before we launch and be able to relax and let, her, let this vehicle off the ground and finally say goodbye. I think she's ready to go. You've worked for years, some of us have worked for five, six years to get to this point, and it always seemed like it was so far away, so far away, it was never really going to come. And what's amazing, when we came down here in June, it still seemed like it was a long way away. July, August, September comes and goes, and now you realize, wow, the number of weeks are you can count on one hand. See, I've had the privilege of working with the Mars Science Laboratory mission for the past three years and I will dare say it's probably one of the coolest missions that I've worked on. Uh, not just because of the science objectives, but the scale of the rover itself, uh, the challenges that the team has gone through uh, to try to meet the science objectives, to make sure that the payloads and the instruments operate as they should. Uh, the launch vehicle that we're using, the Atlas V 541, this is the first flight of a 541 launch vehicle. Uh, what we do is we roll out the rocket from the vertical integration facility out to the launch pad. We use what's called a clean launch pad approach and we do that um, two days before the launch. At that point we connect the rocket and the mobile launch platform to the, uh, to the launch pad and that's how we're able to uh, load our um, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen on board 
and actually made up the electrical connectors that have to power up the uh, rocket and the spacecraft uh, while it's at the pad. Certainly we're confident in our systems now, but we keep checking them. Uh, we, we have continuous and a series of predefined tests that we do to make sure that the launch vehicle is, is uh, communicating correctly with, with the spacecraft. There's a million operating components there and they all need to work all simultaneously. You don't want any glitches when you get down to just a week before launch. The planets align only every two years and you only get about a three week window. So if you're not ready to launch, the uh, planets move out of alignment and you're waiting another two years. So it's very critical that we don't have anything that would delay our schedule and make us miss the launch opportunity. Launch day, uh, the weather doesn't look too bad. Uh, there is a front that's pushing through. It looks like Wednesday night, uh, Thanksgiving day, it should be pushed south of us, or at least south of central Florida. A bit breezy for roll on Friday, but we should have, should have decent weather. Maybe a threat of an isolated shower coming in with a brisk onshore flow. And that looks similar to Saturday. It looks like the winds decreased just a little bit on Saturday, but anytime we're that breezy with easterly flow, uh, would expect to see some kind of clouds coming in from the Atlantic with the threat of an isolated shower. So that's the principal concern it looks like right now. LC, this is the LD on channel one. LC, you have permission to launch. Roger, we're sitting with the count. T minus 10, 9, 8. Approximately 50 minutes after launch, the spacecraft separates from the upper stage of the launch vehicle. Um, six minutes after that, uh, the spacecraft transmitter sends a signal back to Earth, which is received by the tracking stations. Once uh, we receive that signal, we're ready to send our first command up to the spacecraft, and that actually marks the beginning of the cruise phase. There are some incredible challenges on the way to Mars. Uh, one of the things is there are always anomalies. There are always things that are going to go wrong that you never expected. You have a, a baby spacecraft that is now on its way to Mars, and it's seeing the space environment for the first time. So it's going to see temperature ranges from minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit to plus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And you've got instruments all over the spacecraft. You've got propellant lines that you can't let freeze. And so there's always this challenge of keeping the entire spacecraft tuned thermally. Some of the things that we're going to be doing during the cruise phase are some trajectory correction maneuvers, which are basically pushing us along the path of where we want to end up when we arrive at Mars. The launch vehicle puts us at a specific path on a trajectory, and along the way from here to Mars over the nine months that we're going to be flying there, we need to make small corrections to that. If you were trying to shoot a bow and arrow at a, at a bullseye, at a target, um, and you had taken, you had drawn back the bow and you had shot off the arrow, and you realized all of a sudden that it wasn't actually going to hit the target, how great would it be if you could pause in the middle, make a slight adjustment to the arrow, and watch it hit the target? We have given ourselves six opportunities to make a trajectory correction maneuver. And each of those correction maneuvers is uses the thrusters on the spacecraft to give a little push to the spacecraft to correct its trajectory. One of the things that makes landing on another planet so difficult is that we're essentially trying to hit a moving target. The spacecraft left a planet that was spinning around the sun at its own speed and we're now aiming for another planet. And we can't just aim for where the planet is at the time that we launch, but we have to aim for where we think the planet's going to be by the time that we get there. All of those motions, the navigation team has to carefully track and predict where things are going to be in the solar system in order for us to successfully navigate to Mars. The trip from here to Mars to, is over eight and a half months and we need to make sure that we monitor all the sensitive instruments, science and engineering, to make sure that over the eight and a half month journey, everything is working properly. The better we do our jobs during the cruise phase of the mission, the, the better the entry, descent and landing phase of the mission will go as well as the surface phase. 